My name is Flavia, Flavia Hainoni, and I work with J-Balls for four years and a half now. I'm a great enthusiast of AOSD since I joined. By the way, I joined the company to integrate the J-Balls AOP team. Uh, currently, I work with the J-Balls AS7 team. We are developing the seventh version of the application server. And we are going to start with the keynote from Kirk Cornshield. Uh, before he starts, I'm going to talk a little bit about his biography. So, he's an industry analyst at Burton Group. For 15 years, he worked in the tra trenches on real software projects. In 2002, he wrote the book Java Design, Objects, UML and Process, published by Edson Wesley. He has also written numerous white papers and articles, including the Agile Developer column for the Agile Journal. He also created the open source utility JAR Analyzer, which helped teams manage the dependencies between JAR files uh, and .NET assemblies, respectively. He has trained thousands of software professionals teaching courses on UML, Java, J2E technology, object-oriented development, component-based development, software architecture, and software process. This day, he continues to enjoy hacking in a variety of languages, including Java, .NET, Ruby, PHP, sorry, and Groovy. So he's going to give us his feedback with all the experience that he has put together in the last years. He's going to talk about modularity, agility, and architecture paradox. So. Welcome to Kirk Cornshield. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Just a moment to uh, get my laptop hooked up here. I I'd like to uh, congratulate the Student Research Competition Award winners. That's a, that's a, a great accomplishment, uh, by the way. I'd also like to thank the organizing committee for the conference. They have done an absolutely phenomenal job. Uh, they have helped me tremendously on this, on this uh, excursion. Uh, I'm sure they've all done the same for you. So why don't we just take a minute now and, and, and give the organizing committee a round of applause because they have done a phenomenal job and provided us with a beautiful location to host this conference. So the title of today's talk is Modularity, Agility, and Architecture's Paradox. And I'm going to start out uh, with, with a bit of an anecdote uh, to give you something to think about as we walk through the remainder of the uh, presentation. Uh, we're finished up this morning at around 10 o'clock, is that correct? Yeah? Okay. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. That should give us some time for some questions if there are any uh, towards the end. So th there's a law called Dalo's Law. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of it, but uh, what Dalo's Law states is that evolution is irreversible. Yeah, I'm pretty short, so we have to kind of lower everything here so that you can see me over the podium. Yeah. Uh, so Dalo's Law states that evolution is irreversible, and what that means is that once an organism evolves, uh, it's limited based on the, the, the inheritance of its design, and it's unable to evolve uh, into a previous state. So translated rather loosely, uh, we might look at it as once an egg breaks, you can't unbreak it. Uh, or once a piece of wood burns, uh, you can't unburn it. And all too often, we take this similar approach to software architecture an approach whereby once a decision is made, it's a final decision, and we no longer can change it. And I've seen this uh, numerous times uh, over the years, and there's a few different reasons why I believe that's the case. The first is because the architecture is not resilient enough to accommodate change. 
The second is often because the architect is not willing to make the change. And as we walk through the session today, I'd like you to keep that idea in mind, that of software evolution. I found the discussion yesterday on the retrospectives uh, uh, incredibly interesting. And as I've attended a few of the sessions here throughout the week, uh, I found it fascinating how this concept of modularity, we approach it from so many different angles. I think we all have at least a common set of goals as far as creating extensible, reusable, highly maintainable software systems. But as I, as, as I listen to the folks speak, it seems we're approaching it from a variety of different angles. Uh, and when I, when I watched uh, uh, Mary's keynote on Wednesday, uh, and, and combine that with the discussion last night, uh, I found it incredibly interesting when uh, we, we look at, is code the problem? Or is there some higher level construct that's causing the problems that we're experiencing today? And that's part of what I want to talk about today. So, thank you for having me here. When the organizing committee asked me to speak, I was very excited. I'd never been to Brazil before. I'd never been to an AOSD conference before. Uh, so I immediately said, yeah, sure, would love to. After I thought about it for a while, and after the program schedule came out and I was looking at it, I thought, why do they want me there? An AO, an, a, a conference on aspect-oriented programming, when if you look at my website and the type of things that I write about and the type of things that I've done, there's very little, okay, none actually, on aspect-oriented programming. And so after a few months, I reached out to the conference committee and asked them if they were sure they wanted me to attend. Well, they said that they, they, they were sure uh, and that they were interested in new perspectives on modularity. And so that's what brings me here today. So I warned them uh, that my perspective might differ uh, from, from yours, uh, but I would like to at least challenge you, because you've challenged me this week to think about modularity uh, in, in somewhat different terms. And, and so I'd like to challenge you uh, surrounding what I have to say today, how that might apply to you. And the, the one thing that I've noticed is that while we're approaching modularity from a variety of different angles, we we'd all do have that common goal in mind. And I'm pretty sure, based on what I've seen, that the type of work that a lot of you are doing and the type of work that others in the community are doing with modularity, that there's actually quite a bit of synergy there. And it would be interesting to see us come together uh, and, and really uh, uh, bring modularity more to, the fore, uh, more to the forefront. I saw a quote out there yesterday, and I won't do it at all justice. So if whoever put the quote, is, uh, quote uh, could help me out a little bit. But it said something to the effect that, uh, uh, to, to conquer, we must first divide, and then to rule, we must unite. Is, is that, does that do it justice? Did anybody see that quote? Is that right? Okay. Uh, and, and to an extent, that's what I see, is that we, we do have this somewhat div uh, uh, these divisions with the community. And that's why I thought Mary's suggestion that we look at the retrospective and we try to identify the common themes uh, of modularity traced back uh, uh, decades ago uh, to where we're at now. So oftentimes we talk about modularity as a concept, and I alluded to this yesterday in the retrospective as well. We talk about modularity as a concept. And what does it take to design modular software? The one thing that I'm not convinced we spend adequate time discussing is what is a software module? We apply modular techniques to develop modular software, but if I tell you, give me a software module that does this, what do you give me? 
What is that thing? It's one of the, I guess, my pet peeves uh, about the software community is that we have a tendency to very loosely define terms, and maybe that's because uh, we disagree on the definition. That very well could be. Uh, Component-oriented programming in the mid to late 90s suffered the same fate, I believe, and thereby, for the most part, died a sudden death. Because when, as I speak to developers, they use the term component so loosely. I've developed a, I've developed a component that, that does this. What is a component? And so this loose definition, I, I think, kind of hurts uh, uh, the industry. So a couple of things I'd like to challenge you to think in terms of, you know, think a little bit differently about modularity, uh, as well as this entity that we oftentimes refer to as uh, a module. So today I'm going to talk about modularity in enterprise software development. Developing these rather large software systems that many organizations have to develop to support their business operations. Exciting stuff, isn't it? But that's where I've spent the majority of my career. And for the last 10 or 15 years or so, I've spent considerable time trying to design software that is modular. Uh, and there are a few shortcomings, or, or, or I should say challenges associated with doing that that I'm going to uh, uh, talk about today. Now I do feel that modularity can be a disruptive technology that will transform how we develop enterprise applications, how we design them, how we develop them, and how we manage them. And oftentimes we think of modularity only in terms of a development paradigm, a design paradigm, how we design modular software. But what impact can modularity have on how we go about deploying software and managing software in a runtime environment? There are many other aspects or benefits, benefits I should say, that we can realize for modular software beyond just increasing the reusability, maintainability, extensibility, malleability, uh, of the software system itself. So I had to change this slide. I originally had 1972 up there, which was the original publication of the Parnas paper, but after the ret retrospective last night, I decided maybe I should add the disclaimer that perhaps um, modularity was an important concept a bit before uh, 1972. Uh, and certainly I'm aware of the fact that modularity goes back in the manufacturing industry and that type of thing a number of years prior, uh, but even in the software industry, uh, I, I found yesterday that, uh, you know, it was a concept that had begun to develop before 1972. So today I'm going to start talking by, I'm going to start by talking about the problem of software complexity. Why is software so complex? Why is it so difficult to build an architect? I'm going to explore the role of software architecture in managing that complexity. From that, we'll find this paradox emerge that we're going to spend some time talking about. And then we're going to dig a bit more deeply into modularity and the role that modularity plays in helping overcome that paradox. So I believe that the notion of or the concept of modularity and really the lack of a, a the defining the term module, uh, it represents a missing intermediary ingredient surrounding how we solve the problem associated with software complexity. I'm going to throw out some numbers here for you uh, uh, to get started. Uh, so this was based on a study. Uh, maybe the person who did this study is in this room. I don't know. Uh, but the link is in the top right corner. Uh, I don't claim that these numbers are entirely accurate, but I have done a bit of research uh, to validate some of the numbers. In 1990, there were 120 li li uh, billion lines of code in the world, supposedly. In 2000, there were 250 billion lines of code. The study concluded that the number of lines of code doubles every seven years. 
Now, this doesn't necessarily factor in the density of programming languages and, uh, and the recent, I guess you might say, emergence of dynamic languages in the enterprise uh, where organizations are exploring using Ruby and Groovy uh, in lieu of statically typed languages. Uh, but, but interesting nonetheless, 50% of development time is simply spent understanding code. And 90% of the cost of software is evolution. So a lot of times we look at architecture as something that we have to do early, something that we have to get right up front. Unfortunately, that's a very, very difficult, if not impossible, task. Especially if 90% of the cost of software is maintenance and evolution. Because software is going to evolve. So putting this in context, what that means is that between 2010 and 2017, we will write more code than we have written, than we have written combined historically. That's a lot of code. That's a lot of code. And this is these ultra-large software systems, I think, that Mary referred to on Wednesday. The size, the complexity of software systems is increasing at a phenomenal rate. When I started developing software, it was pretty simple. At least compare, I, I didn't think it at the time, of course. Uh, but when I look back, uh, developing mainframe applications or client server applications, two tier applications was pretty simple stuff. Now we develop these distributed systems with very, very complex integration points. We have a lot of legacy code, legacy integrations that we need to deal with. The number of third party vendors that serve organizations has increased over time. We have to, inter we have to integrate with vendor products, so on and so forth. The complexity is absolutely phenomenal. Here's an example of the spring framework, the growth from 2002 to 2008, a 500% increase in the number of lines of code. Uh, a couple of other points, uh, a couple of other examples. The Linux kernel in 2004 was at 6 million lines of code. In 2009, it was at 12 million lines of code. FreeBSD, 2002, roughly 8 million. By 2009, it was at 16 million. So there are examples, real-world examples, that substantiate the claim in the study. That software does roughly double every seven years. Is this a bad thing? What happens when software doesn't grow and evolve? It dies, exactly. That's exactly what happens. Have you ever purchased a software product that remained at version one and continued to live? Absolutely not. So layman's law, as a system evolves, it com its complexity increases unless work is done to maintain or reduce it. Evolution is a good thing. Software growth is a good thing. It means that people are using the software that we're developing and that they are demanding more from it. They like it. They want to keep using it. If it doesn't evolve, it dies. Unfortunately, this means that the way that we go about developing software systems today is broken. Big design and big architecture up front with excessive documentation simply doesn't work. We cannot predict how software is going to evolve over time. Instead, we have to design more flexible software that is able to accommodate change. And this leads us to Gall's Law. A complex system that works is invariably found to have evolved from a simple system that worked. A complex system designed from scratch never works and cannot be patched up to make, work, to, 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 to make it work. You have to start over beginning with a working simple system. I've actually witnessed this numerous times spending excessive time trying to design a software architecture before you actually get into the development simply does not work. So how do we design software that possesses this trait of evolvability? 
we need to bring to it some degree of architectural agility. Because evolution is a good thing. It means our software is growing. It means our software is surviving. But as it grows, it must evolve. So I'm going to take a minute here and look at what is architectural agility. And to do that, I want to look at software architecture. What is the goal of software architecture? So I've captured some definitions here. The first is from Philippe Crookton, uh, the, the Rationally Unified Process, and used by Butch Rumba and Jakobsen in the UML uh, user guide. And I've highlighted in red some of the key components of these definitions. Significant decisions about the organization of a software system. Structural elements, interfaces together with behavior. And the composition of these elements into progressively larger subsystems. This is one of my favorite definitions. It talks also about components and interfaces, but it also talks about the social aspect of software architecture. It talks about the fact that your architecture is really what folks understand, the shared understanding of the system design. So it introduces that social aspect. The IEEE definition, fundamental organization of a, of a system, components, relationships, and principles governing its design and its evolution. Another definition, uh, plan of the system at a component level, structure of components, interrelationships, principles and guidelines governing the design and evolution over time. And finally, the last definition, critical design decisions, cost of change, structure of code, the decisions that must be understood and assessed. So I highlighted some key phrases in there. Components, significant decisions, shared understanding, relationships, and organization of the system, and evolution. And even in these definitions, we see that term component again. Well, what is a component? The term is too loosely defined to really have real meaning to the development community. So how do we go about creating architecture that can evolve and has some semblance of agility associated with it? Well, I like Martin Fowler's definition. Architecture is about the important stuff. And what is important? Architecture is the stuff that is difficult to change. It has a significant impact of change. And the cost of change might also be significant as well. So when I say that something is architecturally significant, what I'm saying is that changing that is going to require a lot of time, and it's going to require a lot of effort. For instance, if I'm developing an application, and that application uses an Oracle database, and after two years I decide that I no longer want to use the or Oracle as my database, but I want to use DB2 as my database, is that an architecturally significant change? Perhaps. To an extent, it, 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 it depends on how the data abstraction layer was developed. If my SQL leverages proprietary Oracle extensions, it could be a significant change to go through and modify those SQL statements. So architecture is the important stuff. Impact of change is significant. Cost of change is significant. But what if we're able to reduce the impact and cost of change? If we're able to reduce the impact and cost of change, then it's no longer architecture. So effectively, we need to try to eliminate architecture. And probably more importantly, or appropriately, I should say, we need to try to minimize the architectural impact and cost of change within our applications. 
Therefore, this is the goal of architecture, to minimize the impact and cost of change. And how do we do that? Well, Mary Poppendiek and, and Tom uh, Poppendiek in the book Implementing Lean Software Development from Concept to Cash talk about the notion of reversible and irreversible decisions. And as much as possible, we should try to make as many decisions reversible as we can. Because reversible decisions can be easily changed because the architecture is able to accommodate that change. On the other hand, there will always be some set of irreversible decisions. Irreversible decisions are not easily changed. They're too expensive or too resource intensive. We simply can't do it in some situations. For instance, we might decide to develop atop the Java platform. Three years later, deciding that Java is no longer the platform that we want to, to pursue anymore, we may decide that we want to move in a different direction and go with .NET or Ruby or some other platform. That is likely an irreversible decision because the cost and impact of doing so is significant. Now there may be other factors such that we decide to, but for an application uh, uh, from application to application, probably not possible. Now what this tells us is that reversible decisions can be made at any time. It doesn't matter when we make a reversible decision because we've given ourselves the flexibility to change our mind. But when should we make irreversible decisions? In fact, irreversible decisions should be made as late as possible because we can't change our mind. And trying to make irreversible decisions early in the software development life cycle when we possess less knowledge surrounding the ramifications of those decisions, it's much more likely that we'll get it wrong. So reversible decisions anytime, irreversible decisions, we should try to delay until the last responsible moment. So the goal of architecture is to reduce the imp or, uh, layman's law says that software systems must evolve. We have to reduce the, uh, by reducing the impact and cost of change. We need to try to make as many decisions reversible as possible. And this is what's going to encourage us or deliver for us this notion of evolutionary uh, and adaptable architecture. So how do we do this? How do we create systems that are highly adaptable, uh, uh, extensible, uh, and can evolve? Flexibility, right? We apply advanced programming techniques, aspects, objects, so on and so forth to create these highly flexible software systems. I've used the Spring framework extensively in the past and one of the benefits of Spring uh, is this notion of dependency injection. Injection is very, very popular within organizations today because it lends a way for them to easily decouple their code. The problem is that flexibility will oftentimes breed complexity. And this is the paradox that I talk about. As we create software that is incredibly flexible, it also turns incredibly complex. And here's a quote from Ralph Johnson in an article written by Martin Fowler called uh, Who Needs an Architect? Making everything easy to change makes the entire system very complex. So as we try to create reusable, composable, extensible, uh, lightweight and, and, and uh, software entities, those entities also become more difficult to use. They become more difficult to maintain. 
and they become very difficult to understand. Now, it's probably never happened to any of you, but I know that in some situations, I've witnessed developers who have gone in and looked at other developers' code and said, wow, this is a bunch of crap. Developers tend not to like maintaining other developers' code for whatever reason. I'm not sure that any degree of flexibility will ever overcome that human element associated with maintaining a software system. Because oftentimes, things that we don't understand, we tend to label as garbage. Or we tend to, what I like to say, flip the bit and just move on, move past it. And so oftentimes, we'll, when we see this code, we'll either rewrite it in our own terms, so on and so forth. So the more flexible something is, the more complex it is, the more difficult it is to understand. There's also this tension at play that as I try to create software entities that are more reusable, extensible, maintainable, they become more difficult to use. So for example, when I say I'm creating a lightweight software entity, what that means to me is that I am creating a software entity that is not tightly, that is not tightly coupled to an environment. That's one of the benefits of Spring over a lot of enterprise Java specifications is that Spring allows you to develop soft, lightweight software, software that isn't tightly coupled to a Java EE container. As I try to create fine-grained entities that are highly reusable, there is this explosion in context dependencies that have to be managed. And so the finer grained, the lighter weight that I make something, i.e., the more reusable something is, the more difficult it is for someone else to grab and try to use it because they're required to configure it to context. And this is a variation of a quote by Clemens Zerpinski in his book Component Oriented Software Development where he says maximizing reuse minimizes use and I've <laughs> modified that to say that maximizing use reuse complicates use. As we increase the reusability, we make that entity more difficult to use. How do we solve that problem? We try to create flexible software that isn't as complex. But this begs the question, where within a software system do I need that flexibility when there is no way that I can know where I need that flexibility early in the software development life cycle because the software is going to evolve over time. So where do I put the flexibility? If I put the flexibility everywhere, it makes it much more flexible and easier to change, but it also makes it incredibly complex. So this begs the question of where thereby bringing us to the point that as we create software that is incredibly uh, flexible and possesses the ability to evolve over time, we're also creating software that is more complex, thereby decreasing its ability to survive. So therein lies the paradox. The key then is that we must recognize which areas of the system demand the increased complexity that will bring greater flexibility? And as you might guess, I believe that modularity plays an important role in helping us reach this point. I believe modularity plays a very, very important role in helping us realize or develop software systems 
that are flexible yet forego much of the complexity. And here we're just revisiting that slide from earlier where we show how we try to reduce the impact and cost of change by making decisions reversible, designing incredibly flexible software, uh, but, but ultimately we're increasing the complexity. So that brings us to modularity. How does modularity help increase architectural agility? How does it help us realize reuse? And how does it overcome the paradox associated with flexibility and complexibility and the tension between reuse and, re and, and use? So how do we manage complexity and increase agility? My answer, modularity. Now, modularity. The more modular a software system is, the easier to maintain and extend. The less modular, the more difficult to maintain and extend. Modular software should be more reusable. It should result in a reduction of complexity, I would hope. Increased maintenance, or ease maintenance. Not increased maintenance, ease maintenance. And increased extensibility. But you might sit there and say, but but we already have programming constructs that allow us to do this. Objects, aspects, methods, services, service-oriented architecture. Isn't that the goal of all of these other technologies and techniques that we've used over time? It certainly is. I would argue, though, that one of the primary goals of object-oriented development, at least as it was popularized uh, in the early to mid-90s was that OO meant reuse. How well do you think we've done as an industry by taking advantage of OO in developing highly reusable software? Good, bad, so-so? Good? Well, we got one optimist, optimist in the crowd. <clears throat> Well, within many organizations, OO does not help us create more reusable software. There is a very, very simple lesson, I believe, to be learned from the open source community on how to create reusable software. It's been right in front of us for a very long time. When you go to reuse a piece of open source software, what do you go get? Well, you guys might go get the source code. Yeah, okay. okay. You guys might go get the source code. I understand that. The majority of people, on the other hand, they just go out and they download a binary. They download a unit of deployment that they simply plop into their system and they start using. The fundamental technique, the programming constructs, Everything else is hidden, embedded within that entity. And the majority of developers will never know how well designed or poorly designed the internal structure of that entity actually is. So modularity helps increase architectural agility and it plays an important role in filling in a gap that has existed for quite some time. Not a gap that has existed technologically speaking, but a gap that has existed that, that but a gap that has existed in how we go about designing and protecting software systems. Certainly the programming constructs we use to develop modular software plays an important role. But so too does this missing ingredient. A lot of times we spend considerable. Oh, am I breaking up? Is this better? Okay. Was I yelling? No. Okay. Sometimes I yell. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. So something's been missing from this puzzle. We've got services. We've got some intermediate packaging construct 
In Java, we have packages. We've got classes. Classes represent units of state. Classes represent intra-process reuse. We re re reuse classes within applications. When it comes time to reuse entities across applications, we use some distributed technology like uh, uh, SOAP or uh, REST-based interfaces, web services. But we don't have, well, we do, but we haven't been using it very well, this intermediate construct. And every, every ma doesn't it seem like every major technology trend, at least of the last couple of decades, cites reuse as the primary benefit? Do you, do you guys feel that too? I, I see it all the time. I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but it seems like every time this new technology trend surfaces, it's reuse. And we're going to be able to compose systems from these reusable entities thereby speeding development, uh, 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 increasing quality, so on and so forth. But yet it also seems that we never realize that dream. So here I'm going to tell a story about turtles. I'm sure a lot of you have already heard this story, actually. But what does architecture have to do with, with turtles? Well. A scientist at one point gave a public le lecture on astronomy. How many people have heard this story? OK, so a couple. He described how the Earth orbits around the sun, uh, it, which in turn orbits around the center of the vast collection of stars we call our universe. So at the end of the lecture, this little old lady in the back stands up and said, what you have told us is rubbish. She said, everybody knows that the Earth is supported on the back of a turtle. And the scientist replied by saying, coyly, what is the turtle standing upon? And the little old lady said, you're very clever, young man, but it's turtles all the way down. So what does architecture have to do with turtles? Well. I believe what it has to do with turtles is that we don't architect all the way down. And, and this is where I believe the different communities can come together and bring this notion of architecture all the way down and, and drive it forward. SOA, service-oriented architecture, largely a significant failure within industry. Organizations invested millions, if not billions, in service-oriented architecture. And what did they have to show for it? Very, very little. Organizations were successful with it. I've often said and have had numerous arguments with uh, uh, SOA pundits when I say within, within, a, within each service awaits a rotting design. You might have a, surface, a service that on the surface performs some business process, but what does that give you from an evolution, an evolvability standpoint, a survivability standpoint? If I have this huge service, somebody's got to maintain it. Somebody has to evolve the service. And if that service is not designed well, it's going to be difficult to do. If the service lacks flexibility, then the service is not going to be reusable. Similar with classes. I can have an absolutely beautiful class structure, pristine, abstractions, all this fancy stuff going on all over the place. But if I just take all of that, all of my classes, and just lump them into something and toss it out there, what really have I brought from, from a reuse standpoint? How do I reuse anything? Essentially, what a lot of folks do is they copy and paste, probably the most common form of reuse. So I contend that we're missing something, and that's something that we're missing is modularity. And really, maybe not so much modularity, but the notion of a module.
what is a software module. Designing services by compo services or applications, I should say, by composing them of modules. Within modules, we have packages, and within packages, we have class structures. And the way that we use the programming techniques that y'all are talking about here is what is going to allow us to create a more flexible module structure, managing the dependencies between modules, creating modules that are at the right level of granularity so that they do what they need, but also possess the right degree of extensibility so that I can extend them with the appropriate behaviors when and if I need to. Taking these modules and assembling them to, to develop applications. I also believe there is a social aspect to software architecture. Some of you may have heard or referred to as the ivory tower. There is a gap within many organizations between what the architects do and what the developers do. And there is often not a good communication mechanism between the two. Architects often focus on the high level stuff. So services, uh, the stuff you might say that they feel they have to get right early in the life cycle. Because they're looking at it more from the standpoint of this is going to be really, really difficult to change. Therefore, I need to get it right the first time instead of looking at it in a way where they say, I want to make this as easy to change as possible. And again, I believe modularity fits in there quite perfectly to serve as this intermediary as a social construct. Remember back to the Fowler definition of architecture where there's this social construct associated with software architecture, shared understanding that modularity provides this intermediate social construct that allows folks to communicate more effectively about software architecture. And I believe the best candidate for a module, and here I use the Java platform as an example, is a JAR file. On the .NET platform, it would be a DLL assembly. The characteristics that define a software module as a unit of reuse, as a unit of composition, as a unit of deployment, and a unit of management. Classes are a unit of reuse. I will grant you that. They're a unit of intra-process reuse. But they're not a unit of deployment at least not on all platforms. They're units of composition, but they're not necessarily units of management, how you go about managing applications. And I believe these are some of the attributes of what makes a software entity a module. And as I'll get to in a little bit, not only do we need to define this notion of a module, but we also need to provide tools that allow folks to develop modular software. We need runtime environments and runtime frameworks that allows folks to install software modules and manage them at runtime. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I get too excited, I can't help it. I see, as I'm sure you're all well aware, their m mobile technology has, has, has seen a, a remarkable explosion over the past couple of years with iPhone and Android, and, and you've got Microsoft trying to catch up and, and, and Blackberry trying to catch up. Why, why is that? Why has there been such an explosion? Well, one, they're cool devices. Touch screens, fancy devices, that's good. But that's not why. The real reason why the mobile ecosystem has exploded is because it is now an ecosystem. The reason why everybody wants an iPhone 
is because of the App Store. If the Android marketplace had millions of applications and Apple's App Store only had a few hundred, it's likely that Android would be a much, and actually it probably is now, a much more popular platform. But that's why BlackBerry and Windows Phone 7 are struggling is because the ecosystem isn't as strong. There aren't applications out there. People buy the devices because there are applications. And, and that's the ecosystem surrounding modularity and really the ecosystem that we tried to create with software components in the late, uh, early to mid 90s that largely failed because there was no ecosystem. One, we didn't offer a good definition of component. Two, a lot of the more popular platforms didn't provide runtime support for component-oriented software development. So on the surface, modularity at least provides us the ability to put a nice interface on something. Okay? But that's not really what I want to talk about. I want to get back to which areas of the system demands more flexibility? So here I've got a class structure. If we had a system that were this few classes, we would consider it a very small system, right? But now, let me ask, which of these structural relationships demand the most flexibility? The top one? The down, the down, probably the down, for sure, we can say that, because the down is have more heavily dependent upon, which means that the risk of change is, could be a ripple effect to higher level uh, entities, classes, right? But if we define this thing called a module, and we allocate classes to modules, now where can we say that the impact of change is most significant? I would argue that at this point, it's the boundaries, the points where two modules intersect. At that point, the internal representation of each module, while still important, is not as important as the relationships that span module boundaries. And when we're developing these very, very, I actually drew this by hand, it took me forever. As we're developing these, these large software systems, and even this would not be a large software system. This would still be a very small software system. A large software system will have thousands of classes. Who can understand that structure? Again, shared understanding. Architecture is a shared understanding. I would argue that nobody can understand such a structure such an architecture. Now, what happens if something changes? This little red dot down here, that class changes. Now this is what happens in industry though all the time within many organizations. They've got these huge software systems where they may or they may not have spent time designing class relationships, but really nothing else. They think they have a flexible structure, yet the system is still incredibly difficult to change. This concept of a module allows me to see more easily the impact of change. So if I allocate these classes to modules, and I look at the module relationships, I can at least see the modules that are affected by that change, thereby I can determine if that change is going to affect other classes within those modules. And in this example, where I went from, oh, I'm going way back, where I went from this structure, which is very difficult to identify change, by modularizing the software system, I can see that I have isolated it to these top three left modules in the structure. 
and that if I make a change to something down here, it's only going to affect the modules that are dependent on that module. Barbara Liskov, Liskov, I listened to her speak at Uppsala 2010, and she claimed that it's more important to make programs easier to read than to write. And certainly I can agree with that, given that 90% of the cost of software is with evolution and maintainability. It's very, very important that we make our software systems easier to understand. So here's an example of a software system on the Java platform, how a typical organization would go about uh, 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 delivering the system. They would spend all of this time and effort and energy uh, with d trying to design a flexible system. And then they take all that good stuff they, do they did and they just throw it into a war file. How are you going to reuse anything? How, how, you, you can't reuse anything at that point. You can reuse it within the application, but you can't reuse it across applications. You can expose it as a web service, perhaps, but maybe that, that's not the type of reuse that we want. Platforms that allow you to expose individual methods uh, uh, as, as web services, what, what sort of architecture um, uh, is that as far as extensibility and, and, and really resiliency? Modularizing the application, on the other hand, brings significant advantages. And the techniques that I use to go about creating this structure are incredibly important, whether I use objects or aspects or whatnot. That's going to dictate the relationships between these modules. I now have the flexibility to reuse different aspects of the system. I can reu reuse those two entities. And the reason I have to reuse these two entities is because these two entities are dependent on each uh, 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 There's a dependency between them. I could reuse those three entities separately from the rest of the application. I can reuse that entity separately from the application. And in fact, when I was talking about the open source community earlier, that's what we do. We go out, we download a jar file or a DLL, and we plop it into our application and we use it. And then what we do is we start cursing at it because of all of these unnecessary dependencies on other software entities. So I go and I download software entity X, plug it into my application, and I begin to get compiler errors or runtime errors because something else is missing. And so I have to go out and find out what this X component is dependent upon, and so on and so forth. In large part, because folks are not taking the opportunity, the care, to nurture and minimize the relationships between these modules which is incredibly important to do. And that's where the programming techniques that we use, the design patterns that we use, the principles that we use, uh, each come into play. Another example uh, associated with uh, architecture all the way down. I might have some external process, and I might have four software modules software modules that might use each other um, um, or not, either way. Uh, and I compose this service uh, from these software modules. Well, before I attempted to modularize the application, this service was just a bunch of code. It was this monolithic thing where the service itself might have been reusable, but what if I want to reuse one of the internal entities in that service without something else? What if I want to use the audit module outside the context of the other three modules? Well, I can't modify the service interface if I want, but what if I don't want to make this a distributed call over the wire? What if I want to take this module and simply plug it into my application? 
So it's in process method invocation. Without modules, I can't do that. With modules, I can. I have the flexibility now to add this new process where I can either reuse the service or I can reuse the software modules and compose this new process of the modules. I can use programming techniques to massage and manage the relationships between the software modules. Because that's where the significance, the architectural significance resides. And so it's my claim that filling this intermediate gap with a pretty simple concept, the idea of a software module, defining the attributes of what represents a software module, is going to allow us to create more flexible software that doesn't bring with it the uh, extensive complexity. And as I also alluded to, there's more components to modularity than just modular design, what I refer to as the design paradigm, the, the techniques that we use to identify uh, and create the right set of modules, how we create uh, lightweight modules, fine-grained modules, uh, manage the dependencies between modules. There's also the programming model, which are the frameworks and the technologies that allow us to create modular software. And then there's the infrastructure that offers runtime support for modular architecture. Without infrastructure, there are no guiding principles, or there, there are no, there, there, there is nothing for me to measure my system against. I can say that I have a modular system, but again, your idea of modularity and my idea of modularity might be completely different. So unless we have some infrastructure that actually enforces the, 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 the principles of modularity, it's going to be incredibly difficult to be consistent in how we go about approaching the design of modular software systems. So I oftentimes ask folks if they're designing modular software systems today, typically when I, when I speak. I ask them if they design class relationships. Now these numbers aren't exact, but these are representative numbers based on typically who raises their hands. I ask how many design class relationships. Almost everybody raises their hand. They spend time doing object-oriented design. I asked how many design package relationships? A good, uh, uh, about a quarter, 25% of the folks raised their hand. I asked how many people are here developing service-oriented architecture and are designing service relationships? Well, that's the architect's job, so actually quite a few tend to raise their hands. People are designing service relationships. But then I ask how many people are spending time De determining how they take these class structures and they allocate them to their units of deployment. Very few people raise their hand. It's just not happening. It's a failed lesson from the open source community. The open source community does it. They have to do it because that's how you create reusable software. I'm not sure if I had it up here. I think I did. I, mu I, I may not have alluded to it, but the unit of reuse is the unit of release. The reuse-release equivalency principle uh, espoused by Robert Martin. We reuse deployable units of software. And why aren't people designing software like this today? Again, I go back to the fact that the platforms and the frameworks and the tools that we use do not encourage modular software design. It's only in the mind of the designer. That's where it exists today. When I look at other technology trends, objects, for instance, aspects, you've got compilers, you've got tools, you've got refactoring tools that allow you to use these techniques more effectively. I've got more service-oriented architecture vendors than I can count uh, on, on both hands and feet willing to sell you 
a product, an enterprise service bus, UDDI registries, so on and so forth. At least there are tools available. And where are the tools that allow me to develop more modular software systems? The platforms don't support it. Eventually they will. And there's a lot of work underway today, at least in the Java community, to bring modularity to the platform. And whether or not you appreciate OSGI or not, <laughs> and I am not here to talk about, I haven't, that's the first time I've used the, used the term, isn't it? First time, first time. But this is what's happening today. This is what's happening. It doesn't force you into a particular style of programming. Some, some will argue that it's too complex, and it is. It's fraught with accidental complexity today because there is a lack of tools available, a significant lack of tools that make programming, that make the programming model easy to use. It's getting better, but it's still difficult. But even once the tools are available and the platform support it, we still have the challenge of just designing modular software systems. Because the tools aren't going to solve a problem for somebody that doesn't know how to design modular software. Just like using Java or C Sharp or Ruby is not going to guarantee that you're creating object-oriented software. So that pretty much concludes what I have to say. Uh, eventually, I would like to see an ecosystem surrounding modularity, whether it's OSGI or Jigsaw or some other lightweight, better module system. It really doesn't matter to me. I just see OSGI as the front runner today. Whether or not it's the one that actually wins, it, uh, it doesn't matter. I would just like to see more platform support and frameworks that support, encourage, and enforce modularity. So I'd like to thank you all for, for, for allowing me to, to, to speak here today. These and a lot of other ideas uh, are discussed in a book that uh, should be published in September. Uh, you can read the initial draft manuscript of the book in its entirety at that website. Uh, avoid typos and grammatical errors. It's not been professional copyrighted or uh, copy edited. Uh, in addition, there's a lot of code that goes along with the book. One thing that I would love to see is uh, you take a look at that GitHub repo. I would love to see folks go out there uh, and, and, and try to take uh, some of the, the things that I've done as far as managing dependencies between modules uh, and start applying different techniques, uh, such as aspects, to manage those dependencies and to see how the structure to see how the structure uh, 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 can, can be either more or less malleable. So again, uh, thank you very much for having me. I'll stick around for a while if anyone has any questions or comments. Any questions? I do have a question. <clears throat> Have you ever worked with a company uh, where you had a lot of difficulty to convince a team, a team that was so confident that the amount of flexibility in their system was very good? Have you ever had problems to convince them that this is what was causing all the problems that they were facing? Uh, so have I ever worked with a team that, that where I've been able to convince them that these are yeah. the problems that are or these are what's going to solve their problems. Yeah. Uh, I've actually done it uh, on a lot of teams applied these concepts. Um, so while a, a lot of the discussion uh, is, is somewhat abstract, uh, applying the concepts, uh, using 
Uh, the simple uh, notion of a jar file as a module, uh, really focusing on managing the dependencies between modules and then applying the appropriate programming techniques, yes. Uh, I've done it for a lot of different software systems. I'll give you an example uh, of one where it's very relevant. Uh, I was working on a very, very large system one time um, that had to take, uh, that had to process information that was entered via a web interface, and it also had to process information uh, that was that came through as a as an EDI feed, electronic data interchange, uh, on a batch process at night. The same set of data, but two different input points. Okay, uh, in that situation, we were able to take the modules that we developed and use them within the web app and also use them within the batch application. The batch application ran directly atop the JVM outside the context of an application server. The web app, of course, ran uh, within a Java EE compliant app server. Thank you. We have a question here. Yeah. Well, I liked very much this uh, turtle, turtles all the way huh? <laughs> <laughs> analogy. And that's what I miss very often in um, technology stacks that are popular out there today. And that's uh, kind of part of my okay. my note about OSGI, <laughs> nothing against right, OSGI. Right. It's probably the best we got so far. But still, I don't believe that we can ha handle complexity by just uh, getting better tools. They are very important. Yes, I agree. No question. But we need simpler programming models, kind of turtles all the way. Yeah, you had this, uh, this slide on the ivory architectural's architectures mm -hmm. ivory t tower and then there were classes and packages and modules yep. and you got services and you got bundles and yep. i don't know got confused i mean <laughs> so my dream would be that we got tur turtles all the way <laughs> smaller bigger just just like in your picture right? yeah yeah no i i agree um t tools oftentimes create more problems than they solve uh for for, for one thing um but, but I, do, I, I do feel that we need to, to, to and, and I think we're in agreement here, that we do need to, to have this notion of architecture and that it needs to be simple and it needs to be all the way from the top level entities all the way down uh, to, to the, 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 the deepest bowels of, of the, the, the code in the application. So I, I was wondering exactly what about a jar file makes it great for being a module. Could you say more about that? Yeah, well, there, there, there's a couple of different things. And, and uh, one, it's here today. Okay, one, one it's here. Um, two, it's a unit of deployment. And some of those characteristics that I had up there, unit of reuse, unit of deployment, um, on, sta on the standard Java platform, uh, it gives us this, this thing to take and deploy to, to multiple applications by including it in the class pass on and so forth. Um, if I look at it from a, 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 modular, a, a, a module system standpoint, uh, it now becomes a unit of management within an application. Uh, so the ability to deploy, to hot deploy, to undeploy, uh, to replace existing <coughs> system entities um, uh, and remove others at runtime and, and get that dynamic adaptability, um, I believe it's a, it's a great candidate for that. And, and not only a great candidate, uh, but also something that's proven. And, and since I like simple things, even, even though you'll probably disagree with me because I talk about OSGI there, even though I like simple, I, I do like simple things, which is why I like the notion of a jar file uh, as, as a module. And I have argued profusely with the OSGI community uh, that the lack of tools and the complexity uh, that they see is, is necessary by things like the application server. When I'm designing an application server, I have a different set of needs than when I'm de de designing an enterprise business application. And I think they could do a tremendous amount to simplify the module platform. OK. Um, I like your argument. And I basically agree that uh, Java file is a good unit of modular, modularity, and classes are not. But well, today, most of Java files, many Java files of open source projects are just a class library. So it's a collection of classes. So I'm somewhat confused. So what, what's, why you say Java files are good, but you know, classes are not? We, we don't deploy classes. Classes are not independent units of deployment. 
and yeah. I, that, that, that's my, that, I guess that's the fundamental reason. Uh -huh. Okay, I have in some sense a follow-up question to that question. So I understand your argumentation that uh, the files are more executable files, uh, are, or can be a good notion of module with respect to the different criteria you mentioned. Uh, and that uh, other notions of components, let's say, are too perhaps fine-grained and uh, too intricate uh, to, to serve at that kind of module. But on the other hand, um, <clears throat> in order to assemble and manage large-scale uh, applications, you, you need probably more and more uh, precise information about what's going on in the module. So that goes a little bit into the direction by, by Shiba. So, in a certain sense, you have a paradoxical situation. Huh? You say, okay, it's, it's simpler, and so we can better use it for the different tasks you mentioned. But on the other end, it's perhaps too simple. When you, deploy, when you deploy today something based on an application server, that's not really a simple thing to do either. So, how do you think this, uh, yeah, at least uh, apparently paradoxical situation, can be resolved? Yeah, yeah. So, um, if, if I understand it correctly, um, the, the, or w w what you were asking is, uh, perhaps a jar file is too simple to, to really bring this, uh, uh, to really address the complexity uh, and the type of problems that, that we need to solve. Uh, I won't argue that today there are shortcomings of designing modular software by treating the jar file as a software module. I won't argue with that. Uh, there are certainly difficulties in doing it. Um, standard Java, the flat class path, the flat class path, so on and so forth, present problems. But I would also argue that it's the best candidate, and that I don't see anything better out there today than a jar file as the unit of modularity because it does address this intermediate uh, 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 design construct that sits between classes and sits between higher level services and applications that folks aren't focusing on. And, and I do believe we need that uh, uh, unit of deployment that brings more manageability to applications. Um, uh, um, and unit of deployment that allows us to easily reuse uh, entities. Uh, a unit of deployment whereby uh, uh, I can't remember who, I, I, uh, I think it was one of the, key, the keynote yesterday, uh, where we were talking about uh, modules where sometimes you need to restrict how a module is used and other times you want to kind of expose uh, some of its internal constructs to certain types of other modules. Uh, I would differentiate that by saying uh, there's a difference between a module's published API and a module's public API. Uh, and the published API is something that we would uh, uh, publicly make available to anyone to use. Uh, something that we can't do uh, with standard Java today. So there are shortcomings, I just feel it's the best candidate. Um, may I just disagree to, to what you have said before? <laughs> um, Absolutely. I, mean, I, like, I like to talk very much, so that's, that's all very interesting and I guess very true. Um, and, but I think just the JAR file is not it's not what you need, right? You need much more to be able to deploy, especially in an enterprise in an enterprise system where you have to deploy in the J2E container, right? So you would need explicit dependencies. You would need to configure um, databases and so on, right? So you, you would need much more information. Um, so it's not enough because the JAR file is, is basically just the list of classes with the classes that you need, but, but there is much more around that, right? So yes. I'd be interested in actually how you how do you deal with that with uh, with your projects such well, that they are actually easily to, to maintain and uh, yeah know. yeah uh, first of all because the in, because the infrastructure doesn't treat a jar file as a module you you don't have the manageability at the jar file level it, it's in my opinion a, sh a significant shortcoming of Java EE it's something that the community is trying to fix. Uh, with Project Jigsaw, where they're trying to modularize the JDK. Obviously, you've got OSGI. Uh, there's a lot of dissension between the two groups today. It would be nice to see them come together, uh, but you're exactly right. 
runtime support doesn't exist today. On some platforms it does, uh, but on a lot of platforms it doesn't exist, uh, and so it's difficult to do. That's what led me back in uh, roughly 2001 when I started really getting into designing systems this way to write JAR Analyzer is because there was no good way to design modular software systems you treating the JAR file as the unit of modularity. How do I manage dependencies when I can't see them? How do I manage dependencies when I have nothing to enforce the dependencies that exist between JAR files? How do I manage dependencies when the class path treats everything as essentially a global entity? Okay? Uh, so I have to, in order to manage the dependencies, I have to understand them. And that's what JAR Analyzer does for me, um, is, is allows me to visually see the relationships between JAR files. Um, I've used other techniques as far as uh, build processes, uh, where I can build uh, using a class path where I'm only dependent on the modules that I should be dependent upon, and that prohibits other developers from establishing unnecessary, unnecessary or undesirable de dependencies. Uh, and then eventually I hope to see some type of runtime support that will make uh, it, it easier to manage at runtime as well. Well, I'm going to ask just the last few questions, people who are on the microphone. Oh, you can do the comment later. So one last question, please. Okay, I guess, I mean, we can debate clearly at uh, break about whether JAR unit is, uh, clearly a JAR is one way of doing modules, but I guess okay. it depends on your platform and Okay, if yeah. you're working exclusively with Java, sure. maybe that's kind of nice. Most systems I work with, are, if you get ultra large scale, as you're growing, you're going to be working with a lot of different things. So I guess when I really think of modularity, I think there's a lot of other things like, you know, especially, I'm not saying SOA, that's clearly a failure in a way, but lightweight services, uh, web type services, or even the cloud type things. There's other ways of thinking of different levels of modularity and a lot yep. of other complexities that were pointed out. Oh, yeah. So as we really kind of grow with modularity, which some might include jar files, that might be one unit of stuff, but there's all these other types of levels of modularity that really need to kind of grow. Absolutely. And, and there's a little bit of promise, maybe with some of these lightweight web services, or I don't even have to worry about how you've implemented it, but as you alluded to with the jar, the public interface is, is important, regardless of whether you did it with Java or Smalltalk or Ruby or whatever behind it, as long as I kind of understand that and can get good reuse potentially out of that type of module. So I think that's one of the things that I was kind of trying to pick out of what you were saying here from that. Right, yeah, and I, I agree. I think that goes back to the, the architecture all the way down. And, and maybe I should say modularity all the way down uh, might be a better way to say it actually. Uh, because that's really what it, what it is, is, is modularity all the way down. Um, and again, I just feel that there's this intermediate uh, ingredient that's, that's been missing. By the way, if you, if you check out the code samples um, on the, the GitHub repo, uh, you, you'll find that there's samples that are written not just in Java, uh, but also Scala uh, and Groovy. Uh, and, and it shows how you can substitute different modules written in different languages for other modules, so on and so forth. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you.